also known as the hashtag HypEd series. Here we focus on the presentation of various hypertension position papers, cases, or other topics. Today, we're going to discuss the scientific statement from the American Heart Association, revascularization for renal vascular disease. Dr. Steve Crowley from Duke and myself, Neeraj Dawn from the University of Edinburgh, will moderate this session, which will be a 45-minute presentation followed by approximately 15 minutes of Q&A. So please go ahead and place questions into the chat. We'll try and get to all of your questions, but many apologies if we are unable to get to all of them. For this session, we are fortunate enough to have one of the authors of the statement, Dr. Vivek Bala, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine and Nephrology at Stanford. Dr. Bala directs a basic science research program on the role of the kidney in diseases such as diabetes and hypertension using in vivo and in vitro approaches. Dr. Bala founded and directs the nationally accredited Stanford Hypertension Center and has clinical research interests related to the role of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system in hypertension and kidney disease. Joining Dr. Bala is our case presenter, Dr. Daniela Kadian Dodov who's an assistant professor of medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in the sections of vascular medicine and vascular diagnostics. Dr. Kadian Dodov is an expert in atherosclerotic and non-atherosclerotic vascular diseases and is currently involved in several research trials <clears throat> focusing on improved knowledge in the pathophysiology, genetics and management of fibromuscular dysplasia, cervical artery dissection and coronary artery dissection. To provide additional context during the Q&A, we have four additional panelists to act as expert discussants. Dr. Thanos Saratsis from the Glenfield Hospital and University of Leicester. Professor Lila Lerman from Mayo Clinic's Division of Nephrology and Hypertension. Dr. Josh Beckman from the University of Texas Southwestern's Cardiovascular Division. And Dr. Sanjay Misra from Mayo Clinic's Department of Radiology. We would very much like to thank our speakers and panelists for their time and participation. For some housekeeping, as an attendee, you are all muted. Please use the Q&A tab to pose your questions, which will be addressed during the panel discussion. And with that, I'm gonna hand over the electronic podium to my colleague, Dr. Bala. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and welcome to all of you who are joining the webinar. Um, uh, we are going to spend the first uh, 20 minutes uh, summarizing our scientific statement on renovascular disease. Um, before we get started, I want to, first of all, thank you all for joining. I also want to um, give a special thanks to the organizers uh, of this webinar, and in particular editors um, at the Hypertendral Journal, who are very kind to um, publish our work uh, and also invite us and organize this webinar. And uh, thank you to our um, panelists as well. So the subject of uh, this first 20 minutes of the presentation is our scientific statement entitled Revascularization for Renovascular Disease. Um, the authors of this scientific statement are listed there. I want to acknowledge our chair, Dr. Stephen Textor, uh, first, as well as some of our co-authors, some of whom are on the call today, Drs. Beckman and Dr. Misura. Uh, and I also want to take note that this scientific statement was a partnership of three different councils of the American Heart Association. So the Council on the Kidney and Cardiovascular Disease, Council on Hypertension, sorry, four, Council on Peripheral Vascular Disease, and the Council on Cardiovascular Radiology and Intervention. And I think it took that village to put this together because renovascular disease is at the nexus of all those four subject areas. Uh, a brief outline, I'm gonna go over a rationale for why we decided to put this scientific statement together in the first place then very brief background, uh, then talk about observational and uh, interventional trials in renovascular disease, and then move on to special populations. Uh, the tagline for that is the, is the patients that were not covered in the um, observational studies in the randomized trials. And then I'm gonna uh, touch on technical considerations. And if we have time, I give a um, brief word on future research areas that we felt would be important in the area of renovascular disease. So the rationale for this statement was that 
Uh, in the last few years, there have been two major randomized controlled trials uh, in the area of renal vascular disease, in particular atherosclerotic vascular disease, and neither showed a benefit for revascularization. And kind of with that, uh, we noticed that there was a, a pendulum swing to uh, a prior era where renal vascular um, interventions were being done. And then with the results of these two trials, fewer and fewer patients were um, being referred for um, diagnostic tests, much less therapeutic trials of stenting or angioplasty. And uh, those of us in the field, um, either in the American Heart Association Hypertension Centers um, or in, in the subject areas, felt that it was possibly time to swing, swing the pendulum back a bit um, because there was concern among specialists that there were specific populations that were underrepresented in these randomized control trials that may actually benefit from a renal vascular intervention. But I think another part of the rationale for the statement was we wanted to reaffirm the strength of evidence from these randomized control trials um, and, and sort of uh, reaffirm the populations in, that were studied um, in those trials. So just a brief background, and this is a figure from our statement and was put together by Dr. Textor. Renovascular hypertension is on a spectrum in one end having a, a renal artery stenosis and on the other end having ischemic nephropathy. And the idea of revascularization from a theoretical standpoint is that it is most likely to be of benefit, not at one end of the spectrum and not at the other end of the spectrum, but somewhere in the middle. Uh, we all know that renal artery blood flow uh, is not flow limiting with an initial stenosis, but that with a gradual increase in that stenosis, you begin to see hormonal evidence of that lack of blood flow in the form of renin-dependent hypertension, so renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone release. Uh, and then one, one uh, develops sodium retention. And if this decrease in blood flow persists, then one starts to see some of the changes that can occur in the tissue itself. So this may lead to microvascular remodeling, to endothelial activation, uh, and consequences of tissue hypoxia. That tissue hypoxia can turn into injury and inflammation, and eventually into fibrosis uh, at the tail end of this spectrum of ischemic nephropathy. And when we're thinking about um, intervention for renovascular disease, we don't yet have biomarkers um, for where on the spectrum any one patient is in cross-section when we encounter the patient. But in preclinical studies, this is thought to be the area with which we would want to intervene, not at one end or the other, but somewhere in the middle. Just for some terms for today. So the primary causes of renovascular hypertension are, are twofold, atherosclerotic renovascular disease, which I will abbreviate as ARVD, and fibromuscular dysplasia, or FMD. And ARVD uh, is rare in the general population of hypertension, uh, but does have a higher prevalence in those with more severe or resistant hypertension, uh, up to about one in six or one in four patients with resistant hypertension may have atherosclerotic vascular disease. In patients in particular with peripheral vascular disease, this number can go up to as high as 40%. We're not really sure what the prevalence of fibromuscular dysplasia is, but we do know that in about two thirds of patients, uh, there is renal artery involvement. So um, for this condition, there have been a number of observational studies, and I'm, I'm going to call this the Wild West for lack of a better term. And unlike current small molecule therapies or procedures such as renal denervation, renal revascularization has been around for the past 50 years without the benefit of randomized control trials. So these randomized control trials are entering entering the game long after practice patterns have been solidified. Uh, before that, there were multiple observational studies, some showing a benefit, but the most important takeaway from these, and I'll show some pictures in a moment, is that the range of BP responses varies widely across a given population. This is one of those observational studies, and of course, the uh, patient number of 72 is uh, emblematic of many of these. They're, they're very small-scale trials. But you can see on the y-axis the delta BP after revascularization, and this is with an ambulatory blood pressure monitor. And you can see that many patients, um, while on average had a drop in blood pressure, systolic blood pressure of about 14 millimeters of mercury, there was a very wide range in this group. And it, it uh, speaks to the idea that 
many of these people may be at a difference point in the spectrum between renal vascular hypertension and ischemic nephropathy. I won't go through all of these studies, but you can see by the end number on the left, whether we're looking at an observational trial of BP responses, renal function decline, or hard cardiovascular endpoints, uh, that these trials were small in number, but most of them showed an average benefit. Of course, they're observational studies. So then we move on to the randomized trials, and I will cover four today. Uh, one is drastic, the other is STAR, the last two are astral and coral. These were all randomized control trials that have occurred in the last 20 years. Uh, drastic was the smallest of these. Uh, this study um, did not, and none of these studies showed a benefit of uh, revascularization. Uh, one of the criticisms behind drastic was that um, about 44% uh, of the patients actually crossed over from the medical arm to the interventional arm during the trial. The next trial that came out was about 10 years later, the STAR trial. Um, this trial was about 140 patients. Uh, one of the comments about this trial was that um, was that the angiographic um, means by which detection of the renovascular uh, lesion was found was with non-invasive imaging. And approximately 40% uh, of the group in the interventional arm ended up not getting stented, uh, 30 to 40%. And so um, a trial like that uh, may bias towards the null very easily. Uh, these two trials preceded the large scale um, hard cardiovascular endpoint trials, which were astral and coral that took place in the last 10 years. Um, astral, as many of you know, was a trial of about 800 uh, patients looking at uh, patients with stenosis and uncontrolled hypertension uh, with maximum medical therapy versus angioplasty and importantly, stenting. Uh, this trial uh, did not show a benefit of stenting or angioplasty compared to medical therapy alone. Um, one of the comments about this trial that has come up uh, since, since then is that um, this trial was supposed to be geared towards patients with a very high rate of severe stenosis, uh, but very few patients in the trial end up having severe stenosis because of the uh, inclusion criteria. And uh, the initial uh, decision as to whether to put a patient into this trial was based on the idea that the patient would, was unlikely to benefit from revascularization. And so um, some folks felt that the entry criteria biased against those that may benefit the most. After ASTRO, um, the CORAL trial was really designed to answer a number of these questions. Uh, it was the largest of these trials. And the initial entry criteria was severe stenosis, as you can see in the second column, uh, which was considered either 80% stenosis or slightly or moderate stenosis of 60 to 80% with a large gradient and hypertension. The only problem with that is that the um, recruitment for this trial was slow, possibly for the same reasons, um, uh, the same recruitment pattern as in ASTRO, but uh, the investigators needed to expand the inclusion criteria to include all those with 60 to 80% stenosis and a GFR less than 60 or hypertension. In other words, there were people that were being recruited into the trial that didn't actually have hypertension at that time, but may have had a single renal artery stenosis of moderate or severe size. This trial was also negative, and it's, it, um, it behooves us to say that in the subgroup analysis, those with severe hypertension or severe stenosis did not have a benefit of stenting over medical therapy. So um, after these four trials, things were all quiet on the Western Front. Uh, in aggregate, our conclusion was these trials indicate that most patients with atherosclerotic vascular disease do not benefit from vascular intervention when treated with optimal medical therapy. But most importantly, these data do not clarify the criteria to identify people with clinical conditions and hemodynamically severe renal artery occlusive disease who may possibly benefit from revascularization. Some of those special populations are shown here in table two. We outlined from observational data um, a number of patient populations that were not represented in these trials that, um, for which there is observational anecdotal evidence that revascularization may be of benefit. Uh, I won't go through each of these um, because some of these populations are quite small, but I want to point to the two red arrows on the right 
uh, either recent onset or exacerbation of hypertension within a year or the absence of proteinuria. Um, and I, I toyed with the idea of not showing data from 1981 after um, going through randomized control trials in the past, but I, I think that this is worth mentioning. Um, this was an uh, observational study done about 40 years ago, um, and it's one of the very few that reported the duration of hypertension uh, in those that um, benefited from, at that time, it was surgical cure. And in this population, uh, the investigators found that those with a high relative renin vein renin on, one, on the affected side versus the non-affected side, and who had a short duration of hypertension, had the maximal chance for benefit. And it was really the duration that drove these numbers. I think it's worth no noting that in the four randomized control trials, only the initial one, only drastic, um, reported the duration of hypertension. Approximately one third of patients had hypertension for less than two years, but no post hoc analysis was performed. And the duration was not specified in any of the other three trials. Uh, one of the subgroup analyses from the latest trial, CORAL, uh, looked at uh, a dichotomy of the population by the median urine albumin creatinine ratio of less than or greater than 22.5 milligrams of albumin per gram of creatinine. This is a very large subgroup given the median. It's about 413 patients. And in this group, uh, the patients with a low urine albumin to creatinine ratio uh, had a benefit uh, with stent versus medical therapy, although there was no difference in blood pressure. And so it remains to be seen whether a lack of proteinuria may be a biomarker for those that may benefit from stent versus medical therapy. Uh, just a brief word on um, technical considerations. Uh, one of the main reasons to consider not doing renal vascularization is complications. Uh, these can occur in about 3 to 5% of cases. Some of the most common complications are atheroemboli, dissection, rupture, and thrombosis. Um, instant restenosis is another complication of percutaneous um, uh, renal artery angioplasty. This can happen over a wide range, depending on the operator, somewhere between 10 and 40%. I'll let Dr. Misra comment on this a little bit later in the hour. Uh, there are multiple risk factors for instant restenosis, uh, and I don't believe that in, in the major trials that this number was reported, except for an astro, where the incidence was about 12%. One of the, um, uh, or rather three of the areas of unmet research needs uh, that we felt um, were important in this area were basic research needs, including non-invasive biomarkers to discern potential benefits of where on the spectrum from renovascular hypertension to, um, to ischemic nephropathy one is. And also, and we didn't have time to talk about primary muscular dysplasia, but this is a condition for which revascularization is of benefit. And in, in particular, angioplasty, even without a stent, can work. And why that is, we don't quite know. As far as translational research, um, looking at treatments for ischemic nephropathy, including Dr. Textor's recent cellular trial or agents for mitochondrial protection. And for clinical research, um, narrowing in on these special populations and readdressing uh, the need for revascularization with the new AHA ACC guidelines that have come out after the latest randomized control trial. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank, uh, I'll just move on to the end. I'd like to thank all of um, our co-authors on the paper and a few acknowledgments to Dr. Bactris, who actually kicked off this, um, uh, this statement uh, in a joint hypertension KCBD meeting, as well as two of the member, two of the staff members at AHA who have been instrumental in getting this done, and Leonard and Radhika Rajagopal. And with that, I'll turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Karian Dodov. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very happy to be here with you all today. I'd like to remind the attendees to please submit questions through um, the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, I've picked a couple cases uh, today to illustrate some of the points that were brought out by Dr. Bala's presentation. Um, so I'm gonna get that going. Okay, so um, my case is a 64 year old lady who has renal artery stenosis and progressive chronic kidney disease. She's had hypertension since 1992. Um, she recently went from CKD stage three to four over the last two months. So her GFR went from about 38 to 24. She had been on lisinopril, but that was stopped three weeks ago because of her rising creatinine. 
And seven months prior to presentation, um, she was in the emergency room for hypertensive urgency in the setting of medication non-adherence. Um, her past medical history is additionally notable for prediabetes, osteoarthritis, um, hyperlipidemia, and schizophrenia. You can see here the trend in her creatinine over time. Um, 2.3 is when the lisinopril was DC'd and February was the point at which uh, we met her in clinic. Uh, renin and aldosterone had been checked recently and shown here and her urine microalbumin to creatinine ratio uh, was low. Her current medications are shown here. She was on a diuretic, I just wanna point out, as well as a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker. Um, again, her lisinopril had recently been discontinued. She was on a high potency statin and aspirin. She continued to smoke one cigarette per day, which she had been doing for 40 years. Her blood pressures um, were not discrepant between the left and right side, but elevated. And she was well appearing with no bruits, a normal heart and lung exam and no edema and had otherwise um, equal pulses bilaterally. So she was sent for renal artery duplex, which demonstrated bilateral 60 to 99% stenosis, as well as a discrepancy between her kidney sizes. So what you can see here is the aortic waveform next to the renal artery waveform um, and a very elevated uh, peak systolic velocity of 274. Um, similarly, um, we're looking now in the right kidney, her waveforms appear to be blunted and widened, uh, which supports a um, more proximal severe stenosis. Um, we're also looking here at the resistive index, which is the peak systolic velocity minus end diastolic velocity divided by peak systolic velocity in the kidney cortex. This was 0.7 and 0.66 um, in the mid cortex. So kind of just on the border of normal, if not within normal, above 0.7 is um, considered high. So few uh, questions at this point for our panel. Um, we just heard how the recent renal intervention trials concluded that revascularization did not offer significant benefit over medical therapy in patients with atherosclerotic renal artery disease. Do you think this patient is a good candidate for renal um, revascularization? Well, I'll, <clears throat> I'll jump in since everyone's quiet. This is Josh Beckman. I think the really interesting thing here is that the trials were quite definitive about moderate stenosis. I don't think they were quite definitive about severe stenosis. Uh, and this person has more than one sign that their renal artery occlusive disease is hemodynamically significant <clears throat> in a setting where the kidney itself is not severely diseased and unable to get better even with better blood flow. And so what I look for in these situations, and these are uncommon, although they do occur and that's why we're here, uh, is evidence that the hemodynamics are important, which you had from the rising creatinine on the, on the ACE inhibitor. Uh, and then you have evidence of a significant stenosis by ultrasound by all the criteria you name. And the resistive index and the low uh, albumin to creatinine ratio suggest that the kidney itself is pretty healthy and could benefit from more blood flow. And so I would suggest that this is a reasonable candidate to move forward and consider revascularization. Dr. Bala, do you feel differently or would you agree? Um, I agree in part, but I think there was one piece of information. If we go back one slide, the size of the kidneys um, were quite different, right? The left kidney was actually uh, smaller than the right kidney and the left kidney is the side that has some of the more severe stenosis. So I think one of the things we have to ask ourselves is where would we perform their, the um, revascularization? What would be the best side? I, I think we wouldn't, most people would make an argument that the right side would be the best to do this. Um, but I, I think I would be a bit more conservative than, than Dr. Beckman, um, given that uh, the patient has had, um, may benefit from more optimal medical therapy uh, first before stenosis, before stenting. Okay, and what, that leads me to my second question, I guess. Um, what, what would you optimize? What would you change for this patient? So she was on a high potency statin, just to remind the audience, she was on aspirin, she was on a uh, beta blocker, carvedilol, nifedipine, um, and her lisinopril had recently been DC'd, and furosemide as well. 
so certainly in a patient like this uh, who has severe hypertension, uh, I think it's really important to establish the pillar of a thiazide type diuretic um, as a, a primary agent um, before one can say that they're medically optimized. Um, that would be one comment that I would have. Um, the other comment that I had was that um, you had mentioned some aldo and renin profiling yeah. um, for the patient early on. Uh, that profiling looks like that of a person who's on lisinopril rather than someone who's been discontinued off lisinopril. I'm wondering if you could comment on the timing of that. So I believe it actually was done off of lisinopril, um, but yeah, that's one thing. And then I, I noticed that someone has their hand raised. <laughs> so. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah. Could, I, could I ask, um, sorry, and Vivek, um, the discrepancy in kidney sizes, would you consider um, a split GFR assessment here to understand what contribution each kidney is providing to overall GFR? Is that um, question for you? Oh, sorry, go ahead. It, it's a question for anybody who'd like to answer it. I'll, I'll let others. I, mean, I, think, I think if you're going to revascularize, so this is, um, so once they come to revascularization, uh, this is bilateral renal artery stenosis till proven otherwise, global ischemia, and, and um, if they're optimally medically managed, um, which is one conversation. I think once they come to revascularization, I think it's ideal if you do both sides at the same time, if technically doable. Uh, with somebody with an elevated creatinine, we would normally hydrate them prior to the procedure to reduce any chance of kidney injury from contrast. And we would try to revascularize both, uh, both renal arteries simultaneously. Um, given their anatomy, uh, that may be difficult. So having a split GFR may uh, lead you to treat one side over another, but by, uh, by and large, you need to revascularize both sides um, would be the plan. Is, is that, um, is, are you trying to achieve cardiovascular benefits or renal benefits? Yeah. That's a great question. Uh, in, in our data set in over a thousand patients that we stented and followed uh, with mortality benefit or time to renal replacement therapy. Uh, we found a benefit if you, uh, the patients that did the best had global ischemia, bilateral renal artery stenosis, low, uh, low albuminuria, and stage of the kidney played a role. And so uh, depending on which CKD stage you came in, um, it, it dictated mortality and also dictated time uh, time to uh, kidney replacement therapy or renal replacement therapy. And so we would normally uh, do everything that was done. Uh, we do a 24-hour proteinuria, which gives us a true protein levels um, uh, and, and sort of uh, decide on that what to do. I think, it's I think the other thing that, oh, just, I'm sorry, you go first, Rebecca. No, go ahead, go ahead. The one thing I'll say is that I, I think we're treating this as though the procedure is a highly risk, has high, is a highly risky one, and it's not. In fact, outcomes now under expert hands are actually quite good, and the chances of embolization are quite low. We've already seen the patient's renal function get worse progressively over a period of months. She's now operating with less than half of her normal renal function, and we can presume as from the larger kidney that she has her entire residual. That does not mean, however, number one, that part of the hypertension is not being supported by the, by the smaller kidney. And number two, you can use things like carbon dioxide imaging so that you can reduce the risk further of any kind of contrast injury. And so I would say trying to do further evaluations at this point isn't really necessary as we know there's severe disease. And I'm not quite sure that a thiazide diuretic, which is probably not in use now because it didn't work, and that's why they're on a higher intensity diuretic, um, in the instance we would do not hear about any heart failure. So that's why you put people on this drug because the thiazide didn't work and they need more volume reduction. So I, I think that there's trying to be perfect before you send someone to the lab, or there's or you're basically saying, I, we can demonstrate this and you can you can stage it and do the good kidney first before you do the bad kidney to see what happens. But the risk is so low in this setting in an elective way that 
I don't think it's necessary to delay or do further testing once the diagnosis is established. And at least, and at least one kidney seems to be operating pretty well based on the resistive indices. So, um, Dr. Beckman, as you know, I'm um, I'm a proponent of doing revascularization um, in in a lot of patients where other people are more conservative. But I would I would call into caution one one criteria about this case is the elevated uh, the elevated serum creatinine um, that. Uh, a patient like this, and Dr. Misra, um, please comment on, on your observational study that you quoted, um, but patients with um, residual chronic kidney disease, um, I'm not sure that you would get as much benefit for the blood pressure, and whether you'd be doing this revascularization to prevent progression of that CKD yeah. or, or for the blood pressure, I would imagine that the benefit to the uh, blood pressure would actually be, um, would be modest. Um, but that you'd really be doing it for prevention and progression of disease. Uh, just for context, this patient is um, way off the spectrum of those that were enrolled in randomized control trials. This is definitely the type of patient that we would be reaching for observational data in to figure out what to do. Yeah, so I, I agree with Vivek. I think there's there's three points. One, this patient didn't get enrolled in the randomized trial, either astral or coral. And if you look through the data, you won't see this patient. It's a minority of the patients. Uh, number two, for kidney injury in this patient, we looked at over 400 uh, stents. And the predictor for kidney injury is, believe it or not, albuminuria. So if you had elevated albuminuria or protein levels in the urine, that predicted kidney injury. And this is published in a interventional radiology uh, literature. That's point two. And then the third point is, we would normally do this for stabilization of kidney function. So many of you are nephrologists, stage uh, predicts outcome for mortality. And so stage is the same as having cancer um, that's been staged as well. And so we would try to keep this patient in whatever stage she's in. I'm guessing she's 3B. I don't know what her BMI is, and, and I didn't see a GFR. But my guess is she's in the low 30s, if I had to guess. Um, and maybe we have that information. And so our goal would be to keep her at 30, because at 20, you need an AV fistula, and you're in, you know, you're in a different uh, uh, population of patient then. So those would be the three points. Yeah, so to answer your question, um, her GFR prior to lisinopril was about 35. With lisinopril, she dropped to 24. Yeah. So we could maybe get her back to 35 uh, with stenting, uh, you know, if yeah. everything goes well. I think the other point Josh made is very important. With monorail 014 technology, embolization is rare. Uh, I don't want to say it's rare. Anything can happen. I think the numbers are lower. The published data for uh, large data series from our institution was on 035 systems, and, and it looks worse than monorail does. So that's low profile balloons and stents. And you can use embolic protection device if needed. Uh, we don't routinely use it, but those are all things in the armamentarium now that we can use to prevent embolization. And we're talking about embolization, obviously we're talking about the kidney down, not down the leg, but into the kidney itself. So with a GFR around 30, um, you would still suggest a thiazide diuretic or is that someone you'd be using for osamide BID in? I would probably still use chlorothalidone. Okay. At a higher dose, yeah. So chlorothalidone clearly has benefit compared to uh, in the renal insufficiency patients that was published in the New England Journal recently. Uh, and I'm not saying it's not helpful for, but does anyone think chlorothalidone added now would improve her renal function or make it so that her renal function uh, progressive insufficiency would get better? I don't see how that works. I think- And I guess I'll- Go, go ahead, ahead. Sit back. sorry. I'm just wondering one perspective on this case is that this this person had uh, imaging done um, because they came in with uh, because they were discontinued off their lisinopril, right? Um, and uh, with their creatinine, uh, it would be interesting to note the gradual um, pattern of their GFR decline 
Uh, this is a person with basically no proteinuria uh, or no albuminuria. And when their blood pressure is arguably higher now than it was after um, or preceding the discontinuation of the ACE inhibitor. Uh, and so that patient is unlikely to progress fast um, and probably would never have gotten the renal imaging if not for discontinuation of lisinopril. Um, just, just a comment, because I think it speaks to the idea that we don't often know what's going on in the renal arteries unless there's an event like this. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest things about uh, figuring out in from observational studies as to what what's the best thing to do. I think I that's do, a great point. Yeah. One question that is coming up from uh, at least three of our um, listeners is is the relevant is there relevance of size of that left kidney? Is it too small? Or at what point it is does a kidney become too small to think that uh, doing uh, an intervention will impact uh, kidney function? Does the panel have thoughts on that? So I, I'm just going to jump in because I, I I find the size thing maddening and and just to remember that the kidney. If you look at CTs, the kidney doesn't lay top to bottom on everybody. And so when you go and look at how they measure it, you have to be careful that you're really measuring the kidney like a kidney bean. Um, and it's really from the top of the kidney to the bottom of the kidney. And if you were to look at CT uh, images of some kidneys, they're actually, they become horizontal over time. And so I don't know that size size is what really is uh, important. Remember the, uh, the glomeruli are in the cortex. And if we really were more sophisticated, we'd give you a cortical thickness because um, that's really what we're chasing around. Uh, uh, and sometimes those are just some comments. I, I don't have a size cutoff. I'll answer that question more uh, appropriately. I look at the GFR, the proteinuria and the clinical uh, scenario. I don't look at just the size. Okay. Um, so I mentioned when I presented this case that she had gone in about seven months prior with um, hypertensive urgency in the setting of medication non-compliance. So is medication non-adherence something that you evaluate for routinely before considering revascularization? Um, for example, in, in my practice, I'll use a urine diuretic screen. Is that something that you have added to your algorithm? And, and relevant to that question is a, a question in the chat is, if you are not unable to optimize the medicines, should that push you toward intervention? I mean, I think those two things, so we could spend an entire webinar on medication non-adherence, um, which we all know is a very big problem, even in patients that say that they're adherent, um, and that there are few tools that are ideal in this situation. There are many tools, but there are a few that are ideal. Um, generally speaking, in observational studies, patients with more severe hypertension had a larger benefit from revascularization. Um, and so or patients with resistant hypertension. So I think I would probably want to know um, uh, also just, just from the point of view of the evolution of their blood pressure, um, what their adherence is, but I'm not so sure that a single diuretic screen would tell me that because there's multiple medications that that's not, that doesn't not cover. Um, I think that's something that, that most physicians or most providers have to wrestle with with their pa individual patient as to whether they are being considered adherent or not adherent, knowing that all of us to take multiple medications every day um, don't necessarily need to be labeled as non-adherent if they miss a few doses. But um, in addition to urine diuretic screens, I think there are other laboratory abnormalities that one can look for to suggest adherence um, on, on a long-term basis. Um, but yes, I would probably get some assessment of their blood pressure control on the medications that we think they're on uh, before going forward, um, knowing that patients that are con that are out of control blood pressure, despite maximum medical therapy, adherent medical therapy, probably have a better chance of doing better with an invasive procedure. So I'm not arguing against the revascularization. I'm just um, making comments on on the um, on the thought process going into it. Okay, I will move on, I think. So given the um, 
issues that we discussed in terms of the fact that this patient demonstrated a jump in their GFR with the addition of RAS inhibition um, and the fact that she had resistant hypertension as well as some evidence of ischemic nephropathy, we, we went ahead with renal revascularization. So um, this is an image of the right renal artery. You can see there's a critical stenosis um, right at the ostium there. Um, this was stented with a Herculean elite stent or PTA and stented um, successfully with a pretty good result. Um, now, this is what the left renal artery looked like um, on the aortogram, and uh, the, left kit, the left renal artery was not passed or crossed on angio or attempted to be um, revascularized. So after the procedure with just that one intervention, her creatinine improved to 1.5 from a peak of 2.09. Um, her blood pressures were 150s over 80s at home on furosemide 60, carvedilol 6.25, and nifedipine, which was some modest improvement on the same medications. Um, we repeated a duplex examination, and there was some cortical flow on the repeat duplex on the left side, and we were still getting this 60 to 99 percent stenosis. So the question now is, should you revascularize the left side? And maybe I'll look to Dr. Misra and Dr. Saratsis uh, if you can speak to the procedure in terms of anything um, practically. Would you? It sounds like Dr. Misra would have gone after that left side based on earlier comments. Dr. Saratsis, do you feel the same? Um, yeah, I guess if you've decided uh, to intervene, um, especially with the kind of instruments that we've now got available, the vast majority of us would use an O14 platform for these interventions, which is very safe. Uh, I would probably do both arteries in uh, one go uh, because things have definitely changed quite a lot the last 10 or 15 years in terms of safety and the profile of the devices. The other thing I would say, um, I think there have been a, a few questions about CO2 angio. Um, I've got routine access to um, an automated injector of, of CO2. So I, I will now routinely do my first few angiograms just with CO2. And once you get used to doing things with CO2, you can do the vast majority of these procedures without any contrast um, because you get very decent views with the, the, the more modern um, injectors. Um, so I probably, yeah, I, I, I would have gone for both arteries in one sitting. One question uh, Dr. Basil's raised is uh, whether that bump in creatinine in the lisinopril, lisinopril leads you to think there's bilateral rather than unilateral disease and impacting this decision versus of doing one versus both arteries up front. It can be unilateral disease if the other kidney is dead and you have a gold black kidney. That's perfectly reasonable. We see that not uncommonly. And I think that may be a case here, particularly if even with contrast angio, you cannot see the other kidney light up even on delayed imaging. So in terms of the spectrum and Dr. Textor's spectrum of where this patient's two lesions lie, um, I think the, the stenosis here and the subsequent drop in creatinine would suggest that um, maybe we are past the point of the initial lesion uh, where we have a renin-dependent hypertension and we've transitioned to a volume-dependent hypertension um, uh, on the right particularly, but we don't yet have the rarefaction. We don't have the inflammation of fibrosis on the right. Um, with the smaller kidney on the left, um, we may be heading more towards the ischemic nephropathy kidney and it's possible that um, you may get a benefit from that side, but I think it's going to be markedly less than what you got on the right. Um, so it would be helpful and instructive um, for us, I think, and for patients if we had some biomarker of, of that, um, where on that spectrum one is um, before doing the procedure. But um, afterwards, I think it's very hard to argue that the effect on the right um, was not instrumental for this patient because that's that's a very large drop in creatinine. Um, Dr. Dina, what was the time frame, the time scale over when that creatinine fell? Um, it was over about a six week period. It's pretty quick. Yeah. 
I think I actually have it on one of the upcoming slides um, to show you. I saw an interesting question come in regarding the role of um, SGLT2 inhibition in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, does anybody have any comments? So uh, in all trials, they were shown to be beneficial, but in patients with no proteinuria, uh, they were the least beneficial. So I think the, um, uh, the bang for your buck is less and you have to weigh the risks and benefits of them. But uh, in, in the DAPA-CKD trial, this patient would have been enrolled and would have been part of the benefit arm. So it's, it's not a bad idea at all. There was also a question regarding her smoking, which um, she, uh, we tried very hard to get her to quit and um, she continued to smoke one cigarette a day. But I would not have withheld the intervention for that. Um, I know that was one of the earlier questions that I saw in the chat. I think I cut somebody off. That's okay, you answered the question. I, I, I think the, there's another question in there about would you start an, the ACE inhibitor back now that you've revascularized the right kidney? I would try it. Yeah. I think that's absolutely appropriate. And if the creatinine goes up, you would revascularize the left, if and only if it does? I think that's an amount question. If it went up to from 1.5 to 1.55, no. If it went from 1.5 to 2, yes. So that's your biomarker in this case. Yeah. So um, would anybody go straight to revascularization given the fact that there is perfusion on duplex imaging um, and her blood pressures are still not great? Um, or would you leave that site alone until you reintroduce the ACE inhibitor, as you said? I think now that you didn't revascularize it the first time, you're kind of stuck to let her declare herself on her medical therapy. I mean, I, the other point I'll make, um, just remember that the kidney can lie dormant. So it's not unusual to see cortical flow even with that kind of a stump because you do get cortical um, blood flow from collaterals. And so you will see that uh, on ultrasound and the, the angiogram will look just like it does here. And so it can be a very high grade stenosis, 99% or whatever, and you'll still get uh, perfusion of the cortex through collateral. So just uh, for everyone to remember that. Okay. Well, after discussion with the interventional radiologist that performed the examination and her nephrologist, um, the consensus was that they wanted to try to salvage the left kidney. So um, we, she was sent back to the lab and um, on repeat angiography, they were able to cross that lesion on the left side um, after angioplasty and the first stenting, she was left with a non-limiting uh, flow limiting dissection. So she ended up actually with two balloon expandable stents um, with not very nice cortical flow after that. Um, so next I'll show you just the timeline of her um, creatinine. So she ended up really having no further improvement in her GFR. Her blood pressures did improve to the 130s over 80s um, on the same medical reg regimen. Um, and her uh, we she did end up going back on ARB inhibition as well. Was the improvement in blood pressure due to the the um addition of the AR, the ACE or the ARB, or was it just no? No, it was actually um, changing out some of the, the other agent that she was on, so the core egg was taken away. So I think, um, she, I has, guess that she was, has one stent on the right and two stents on the left? Correct. So I wonder um, uh, if our panel could comment on instant restenosis in this case. Um, you've got a patient with three lesions. Oh, or not, sorry, not three lesions, but three stents. Um, what are the, how often would you follow this patient? Um, what are the chances that um, the little bit of blood flow on the left 
would get significantly worse with an incident restenosis? Would it be flow limiting? Um, it seems stochastically this person has a higher chance of that event given that they have multiple stents. Can you go back one? Can we look at that picture, that angiogram? So I, I, I'll just make a couple of points, uh, Vivek. One, the right kidney, the renal artery diameter of the right renal artery stent was six millimeters. So if you can get a six millimeter or a larger stent, the uh, restenosis rates are much lower. In general, they're about 20% for bare metal stents at one year. So you need to duplex them to make sure there's no restenosis. Most restenoses occur in the first two years. And so I'll routinely uh, duplex everybody uh, every six months. The fact that she has two stents and the way it looks right now on the left, there's two things I'm worried about. One is that stent will fracture because the kidney uh, inspires an expert on inspiration, expiration, the fulcrum is about uh, 18 millimeters to 24 millimeters from the origin. I've had stents fracture, so I know this for a fact. And so the one thing that you have to be careful is the stent on the left doesn't fracture. Um, it's a strong stent, but that'd be the other thing. And then obviously restenosis is going to be higher with a longer stent um, and, and the way the flow looks on the left kidney. So I think she's a setup. I would probably put her on DAPT and leave her on uh, clopidogrel and baby aspirin for a long time, if not forever. Um, so I answered number two and three. I don't know about I, number one. I think we talked about. Yeah, I think so too. There. I think I'll just add, and I know this is an atherosclerotic case and not an FMD case, but I think it's important for people to remember that fibromuscular dysplasia affects the mid-digestal artery. So that is the reason why angioplasty is preferred over stenting in that population because of that risk for stent fracture that Dr. Misra mentioned. Um, so if you can help it at all, you do not want to put stents in that, in that population. We have a, a question about the use of the utility regarding question number three, utility of capsule scintigraphy. And we have a few answers from our panelists, but I don't know if everybody can see that. Um, I didn't know if some of the panelists like might, might like to comment orally on maybe the lack of utility for this or the fact that it's not used so much uh, recently, just so all listeners can, uh, can hear their answers to this question. I, I don't use it a lot. I'll yeah. just, um, I, I use split GFR. I think earlier on someone asked, if I'm concerned about a situation where I'm trying to understand what I'm going to revascularize, I may do a split GFR, but I don't use. I would agree with Dr. Misra on that. Okay, is there um, anything on the horizon that we can look to to perhaps better predict which patients would resp respond to revascularization? Dr. Lerman, do you have any comment on perhaps uh, things we can look to as biomarkers? We, I think we all need one. Um, any yes. comments? And there were some studies that suggested that the bold MRI might be able to provide some prediction of the response of the kidney to revascularization. Uh, including some ratios of uh, uh, the bold MRI and GFR and some other studies that suggested that the level of hypoxia might be predictive. But I think like many other things, it might be a, a J-care of sorts because uh, the kidney can uh, respond to Lasix, for instance, with changes in uh, oxygenation when the function is, when the tubular function is either preserved uh, or uh, or it can lose it completely when the kidney is either uh, dead, so to speak, and cannot respond, or whether it only hibernates. So it's a, a little difficult to know when the kidney re would respond or not. But uh, other MRI procedures that can pos possibly predict is measurement, for example, of renal fibrosis. So far, it hasn't shown uh, much promise in prediction of the stenosis. But uh, these are some uh, imaging studies that could be predictive. There are also some uh, potentially tissue studies, uh, measurements from the renal vein or measurements in the urine of uh, fibrosis uh, markers, oxidative stress, and essence markers that have been proposed. 
Uh, but none of them has been subjected yet to a large enough trial to show that they would be successful predictors. However, I think that there are def definitely several things on the horizon that uh, might be might be proven useful if we interrogate them a little more intensely. Great. Dr. Lemon, I have a question about um, gradient. Uh, do we have the uh, pressure gradient? on either the right or the left? And is that indicative um, of success? So we don't have that um, from the procedure. Dr. Mizra, Dr. Saratsis, would you obtain that? I guess post procedure um, upon completion? Personally, may I say that I've, I've completely stopped doing that the last couple of years or so. Um, I think if you've made a decision to intervene on a patient, you do the best you can um, in order uh, to improve their anatomy. And then in my eyes, I think you're probably just wasting a bit more of your time uh, by doing the gradients. Yeah, I only use it in FMD or uh, problem solving. So if we've decided to stent uh, and we get in there and it's an unequivocal stenosis. Uh, I think someone talked about coral having moderate stenoses. Um, I, I may use it, uh, but by and large, I don't use it that much. I don't know, Vivek, if you're asking uh, to fit as an endpoint or as a beginning point. Of no, I, I, I was asking as a um, pre-stent intra-procedure question. That, that's what I thought. I, I think I think if you look at the coral study, uh, which I think you did a very good job explaining um, the weaknesses and strengths, I think that was one of the biggest criticisms. Uh, stenosis less than 60% or 70%, or whatever, uh, were allowed to be enrolled, and, and that probably uh, didn't help the outcomes. So I think if you're doing, if you're the proceduralist and you're going to do the stent, I think you would stent based on the angiographic findings. And, and if you're not convinced it's stenotic enough, quote unquote, then you may do a pressure gradient. Whether the pressure gradient dictates a better response, uh, I've, I've never, um, I, I don't know that there's any correlation. I, I think that's your question. Uh, I, I may be completely wrong. Uh, I, I no, don't have enough data. I, I think that you're right, uh, Dr. Misra. Uh, I think the studies have tried to use uh, the pressure gradient and they couldn't find that it uh, adequately predicted the response. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dr. Bala. No, not at all. I just wanted to open it up for discussion. So thank you. I think the biomarkers, you know, I know, um, sorry, Vivek, I'm not calling you Dr. Bala, uh, but I think the biomarkers that may be uh, most interesting if we were to exclude patients with albuminuria um, and do a post hoc analysis with the data that's available, I think you would see better results. I think that's one. And, and I've had patients with profound albuminuria. Um, we use 300 milligrams in 24 hours. Um, if we have higher levels and we stent you, it accelerates your injury to the kidney. And I've seen them go into um, uh, you know, larger amounts of albumin uh, in their urine. And so that's that's an area. The other area that's uh, of interest, um, and maybe Dr. Lehrman can comment, there is uh, Goldblatt injury to the contralateral kidney. So if you've got a high-grade stenosis, what's the damage to the contralateral kidney? And you will see patients with high-grade unilateral disease, albuminuria, that's um, um, micro or macro, and that damage is not, I'm not sure if the stent, stented kidney is being protected and it's the contralateral non-stented kidney that's contributing. So if we had a way of sorting out like we do with split GFR, which kidney is the one that's contributing to the proteinuria, that would be helpful as well. It may give us some insight into which patients with unilateral disease should be treated. Dr. Mishra, that's a really interesting point about the idea of not just doing, um, a first doing no harm right? Like um, we consider interventions in patients that we think are going to have a benefit. Um, uh, but, but doing an intervention in someone who actually is worse off 
and not from an instant restenosis, but worse off from a hemodynamic point of view. Um, that's a really interesting thought. It reminds me of the classic diabetic nephropathy cases where there's a unilateral renal artery stenosis in the setting of diabetes, and the kidney that had the stenosis uh, on autopsy had ischemic nephropathy, and the kidney that um, had an open renal artery had florid diabetic nephropathy. Um, and in, in some ways, it, 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 uh, it uh, mirrors the, the experience that you just stated. I think Thank um, you. we're going to have to yep. put it into our discussion, which has been fantastic. Um, so thank you. Thank you all of you for attending this um, HypeEd series webinar. I mean, that was a fabulous discussion. Um, apologies if you put some questions into the chat that we missed during the discussion. Um, for your information, there'll be a recording of this webinar that'll be circulated to everybody who registered and it'll be posted on the um, AHA's lifelong learning site. Um, to stay informed of the future of webinars and um, hypertension journal programming, please be sure to follow us on the Twitter handle at HyperAHA and on Facebook. And um, so with that, I would just like to thank um, the discussants, panelists. Uh, it was absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.